Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Spencer Vignes. Spencer, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. Good to be here in these uh, strange times, but yeah, enjoying it. It's great to be able to link up with you. I did see a tweet that you put out fairly recently, Spencer, in relation to a player who had links to Celtic Football Club, and we'll come to that in a few moments because I was instantly interested because I, I love the Celtic history, particularly when I find something out that I wasn't aware of before. But I understand from looking at your your website that you're a, a Brighton and Hove Albion fan. I am for my sins, about as far away from Glasgow as you can get. Yes, yeah, that's where I come from uh, originally. I'm a, um, I'm a Welsh Norwegian who grew up near Brighton. And so Brighton are my, my football team. I started supporting them in the late seventies when I was about 10 years old and I've supported them ever since. And, uh, yeah, we've been up and down the leagues many a time. At the moment, we're up towards, uh, well, we're up towards the, uh, the upper echelons, you could say, but give us a few years. We'll probably plummet the depths. I would think again. <laughs> now, starting to follow your team in the late 1970s. What's your early memories of actually going to the games? Is it a case of players and events or is it more styles and smells and that kind of experience that you can recall? Oh, well, I only started going because um, we moved to the area and um, I could barely spell football back then. I didn't know what it was at all, but um, everybody else in my primary school played football and uh, supported Brighton. So I joined the local football team and I wasn't very good, but just to try and get in with everybody, I started going to the Brighton games with them. And uh, so um, it didn't take me long. You know, I got pretty involved in it pretty fast. I think, uh, yeah, the the swearing, the football violence, just the kind of, uh, so much about the game has changed from today. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's whiter than white today, but it was, it was very much a different world back then. Just, it was just violence time, wasn't it really? So yeah, so, um, it, I just kind of jumped on board and off you go. And before you know it, you, uh, uh, you know, you, you, it's, I think when you're 10 years old, you just kind of drink in everything that you see around you. And that seemed like normality, and um, it was brilliant. So yeah, yeah, and we were in the top flight then, um, and uh, got into the FA Cup final in 1983. When, as some people may remain may remember, uh, a football player from so shall I say the uh, originally from the other side of Glasgow missed a, a last minute opportunity to uh, win us the cup, and uh, I won't mention him by name just in case uh, anyone tracks me down. Um, and uh, and had me dealt with, um, and yeah, since then we've gone all we've gone all the way down. We've gone to within twenty six minutes of going out of the entire football league, and then we kind of rebuilt and we've come all the way back. And in that time, we lost our football ground, and we built a new football ground. And for two years, we were playing in another football ground, which was about a two hour journey down the motorway from where we uh, where our old home was. Mm-hmm. It's been a roller coaster. There's been some very, very, you know, deep lows and some some amazing highs. But that's football for you, isn't it? That's what you want, I think. Oh, definitely the emotional, the emotional journey. Yeah, yeah. you want you you want some things to kind of you know come along and challenge you a little bit. Maybe not to the extent that we've had losing your ground. Yeah, that uh, that um, should we say uh, causes your hairline to go pretty much overnight. But um, but yeah, it's never dull. It's never dull. So when you look back then, Spencer, who would you regard to be your early heroes or the team that you look back most fondly on at, at Brighton? Well, I think I was, uh, you know, my uh, even now I'm, what, 51 now somehow. I don't know how that happened. But um, I always, I, I think, you know, you, you always kind of, I'm, I'm one of those people who try, I try to look to the future, but I always look back on the past, you know, fondly. And I think the players who were part of the Brighton team who first got us up into the, the top flight of the, the English league for the first time, you know, players like Mark Lawrence and Brian Horton and Peter Ward, uh, players like that, they, they're, you know, they were my boyhood heroes and, and, um, you know, they're still my heroes of today, really. But I think, I think even then I developed a soft spot for kind of clubs, you know, from, from other parts of the country, you know, and you travel around and, and, you know, meet people at lots of other clubs. And again, you know, you, you just develop soft spots for, for strange teams, you know, 
Carlisle United, Berwick Rangers, Plymouth Argyle as well. Brighton will always be my team, but I've, I've got a lot of clubs that I, I look out for, you know, very fondly, you know, at five yeah. o'clock on, on Saturday afternoons. I think like a lot of, um, uh, you know, people of my age, you know, if you, if you grew up south of the border, you often have a favourite Scottish team. And I'm not just saying this, I mean, Celtic were very much my team in the kind of, uh, 19, you know, early 1980s. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I, my dad was a rugby man. Um, but even he appreciated, you know, what the Lisbon Lions had done in that story. Uh, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, a squad could pretty much all, all come from within a few miles of the actual home ground of the team. You know, it, it, it was quite something then, you know, let alone in the early eighties. So, you know, he used to talk about that and that got me interested, but there was, there was one player, if anything, but that, that always, you know, used to get me fascinated by Celtic and that was, uh, Danny McGrain, your old captain. I used to, I, I remember collecting stickers. You know, like uh, like kids do now, but back then, you know, I I collect football seventy eight, football seventy nine, football eighty, and um, and uh, I, I I always get the Danny McGrain. I remember getting the Danny McGrain sticker for the first time and thinking, who the heck is that? You know, it looks as though he just stepped off a kind of Viking longship. You know, he just looked like the kind of man. It was like, oh God, you know, I wouldn't want to mess with him. You know, who is he? And I think through that one man, I kind of adopted Celtic. Celtic were my Scottish team. And I mean this is this is at a time where, you know, Celtic didn't dominate in Scotland like like they have done in the in the last few years. You know, there was the, the kind of new firm going on on the other side of the country, you know, with Dundee United and that team. Mm-hmm. You know, Rangers were buzzing about, you had Hearts doing, you know, some incredible things. So the competitive levels were, you know, were really, really there. And I mean, you know, it wasn't the case of kind of keeping an eye on Celtic just because they won everything, because they didn't back then. But Danny, I just thought, yep, yeah, he's the kind of guy you'd want to follow into a battle. He looks amazing. So, um, yeah, he was my gateway to Celtic Football Club, really. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, Brighton were my team, but, you know, Celtic and lots of other little, you know, uh, smaller clubs as well. I've often gone for the smaller clubs. You know, Berwick. Why Berwick? I don't know. I just always used to, you know, the, the idea of a Scottish team that plays uh, or an English team that plays in Scotland. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I used to look for their results as well. So, yeah, yeah, mad. <laughs> no, but I'm I'm loving the story about Danny McGrain because we still see him regularly around Celtic Park. He's still got the beard that's obviously grey now. But um, what a player, what a, what a man, actually. He's so funny as well. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to speak to him, but what a funny, funny man. You know what? I haven't. And I think it's got probably to the stage now where I wouldn't want to in case he didn't live up to expectations. I mean, most yeah. people, you know, who you grow up, you know, not idolizing necessarily, but, you know, uh, uh, but admiring from afar. You know, most people, you know, I've been lucky to be, to meet a lot of my heroes, not just in sport, but, you know, in, in music. You know, I spent quite a long time writing about music and entertainment as well. And most people do live up to expectations. Um, but you wouldn't want to meet the ones or, or, or find somebody who didn't. But um, yeah, from from what everybody said, yourself including Paul, he sounds, you know, I mean, I mean the, the, the word legend is used a lot, isn't it, these days, and quite often inappropriately. But I think in Danny's case, it's, uh, it's worthy, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And it's interesting to hear your, your view on that memory of Celtic, and it's personified by the likes of Danny, who, you know, all these years later, he's still there. I think at the last count, he had given 42 years service to Celtic as a player and as a coach. So legend is definitely the word for that man. 600 and something appearances, yeah. 630, 640 appearances. I mean, I mean, you know, no one does that anymore. I mean, you know, we live in very, very different times. I think, you know, south of the border, I can think of probably the last player who got, you know, that kind of levels was... Probably Matthew Letizia, you know, at Southampton, the idea of, you know, a player being a one man club yeah. or a one club man, rather. Yeah, you don't get them anymore, do you? No, changing days. And I would also like to hear your views on a few figures, Spencer, who have had careers at Celtic and have also come down and had a spell at Brighton. And it would be interesting to know, because I'm guessing some of them have got good reputations up here and possibly not with your club. It would be interesting to know 
First and foremost, a player who I was hugely impressed with, I liked him a lot, was uh, Beram Kayal, who came in and really, really shone. I think he was hindered and hampered a wee bit by a really bad leg break up here against Rangers as it happens. He eventually left because he wasn't getting the games that his talent, he would have thought, and so would we have, having seen him for a couple of seasons deserved. He, he ended up coming down and he's still with Brighton and Hove Albion. I know that he's had a spell away on loan. Um, how's he been doing down there? He's been doing okay. I mean, we've been, um, I think we've we've often struggled to kind of get a regular kind of settled team. And I think he's he struggled a little bit because of that. You know, we've, uh, I mean, you know, some of it has been forced on us by injuries, you know, and some of it is is just poor form and stuff. He's fondly thought of by supporters, but I think there's a there's a feeling that maybe we haven't seen the best of him. Maybe the best is to come. But again, it it depends. You know, so many players after a bad bad injury, they're never quite the same afterwards. You know, there's there's I don't know whether it's something mentally or you know just in the back of the mind. You know, when you're going in for challenges and things. But um, but no, I'd lo- I'd 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 love to see him. I mean, nice guy as well. Uh, great guy. Hopefully the best is yet to come. But no, we think positively about him in general. That's, you know, he's he's fine. Initially when he started performing for Celtic, he was one of these guys, Spencer, where there was talk of the likes of Ferguson coming up to watch him for Man United. You know, he was really, the levels he was he was at at that stage were, were very, very impressive. And we thought we were going to lose him. But then the injury really did uh, hinder his career at Celtic. Uh, the next one's a wee bit different. I think he's probably a player that Brighton, and you might tell me different, Brighton fans are, are possibly fond of. But he came up here and he flopped, unfortunately, after a £1.5 million pound move to Celtic, and it's Adam Virgo. Yeah, I've got a funny feeling. I had a funny feeling you were going to say that name. Um he did flop, didn't he? No, I mean we, yeah, I mean he's a he's a, a club hero for us. I mean he played through some very dark days when we were kind of playing out of a, an athletic stadium in Brighton um, with a capacity of about six and a half thousand, and yet somehow you know we were we were doing okay. We were in in the, the second tier of kind of English football or going between the second and the third tier at the time. He scored many vital goals for us and. Uh, he was very versatile as well because he could play the centre back or he could play up front, and I think that's what attracted Celtic to him as well. But it didn't work for him, did it? Unfortunately, not. It really did not. And you know, this is the thing as well, Spencer. You know, having you know spoken to a lot of players in your in your career and wrote about the games as well, it's interesting how certain players fit with certain clubs and they can perform. And the minute they move, it's a, it's a difficult thing to see because I think the next player I'm going to mention probably fits into that category as well. He was a perfect fit for Celtic, and that was uh, Paddy McCourt. I mean, we used to sing about Paddy, and he was the Derry Pelly as far as we were concerned. He left, obviously, again, it was for game time, I guess, and he came for a spell to to Brighton. How did he perform for you uh, when he came down to Brighton? Well, I think he was another one where, um, you know, you can sometimes get Marmite players. You know, some fans kind of gravitate towards them and others, you know, are, are not so sure. And I think Paddy was one of them. I think in the early stages, you know, you look at him and you think, oh, you know, you've got something. But I think it was a case of kind of not doing it consistently, not being able to do it on a regular basis at that level. And I mean, the other thing with Brighton is, of course, that, you know, because every five minutes we seem to be in a different league, you know, it's um, it's players sometimes struggle. You know, some players, you know, rise to the challenge when you get promoted and others kind of don't. And um, I, I think Paddy just kind of struggled with the sheer kind of depth of the game a little bit. Um, mm. You'd see the flashes would be there. You'd go, oh, my word, you know, what player? But it was kind of flashes more than, you know, more than anything. So, uh but yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, he's still remembered fondly, but I just think maybe he was just kind of, you know, a little bit too inconsistent and at times possibly out of his depth. But you remember him fondly, don't you? Oh, yes. He's the type of guy that if he comes to, to Scotland to do a, a live event, for example, a Q&A, the whole room stands up and gives him a stand ovation and starts singing a Paddy McCourt song. So, <laughs> Where is he now? He is now the technical director at Derry City. Excellent. Oh, that's so, good. That's good to hear. He's you know good so, to hear he's doing well. 
He is, and uh, very good guy as well, Spencer. But it is interesting. I've only got another uh, another couple of names, and it, again, it's simply because once a player leaves, you know, you're so focused and immersed in your own club that often you might tap into their page online just to see where they ended up. One guy who came in in a blaze of glory because of his playing career, and he was the first Celtic manager never to play for the club, Spencer, was Liam Brady. And he came in, and he spent a lot of money, and then two and a bit years later he left without us winning anything. Again, not the best of times for Celtic, but almost immediately it seemed. He he was back in football, and he was manager of Brighton for, I think, about a year or two. How did things pan out for him down there? Well, I mean, he's, he's still very fondly, you know, remembered. Um, down at Brighton. I mean, it was a real coup for us getting Liam at that time. You know, as you said, it hadn't worked out for him, you know, as Celtic, but, you know, he'd been at Celtic. Celtic were a huge club, you know. So for him to kind of come and manage Brighton when they were in the old third division, so what's now League One in England, and at that time as well was, was, you know, a real coup for the club. The problem was, is, is, we were a basket case of a club back then. We really, really were. This is kind of 1993. Mm-hmm. And we were run basically by, I'm not going to name them, but we were run by people who to all intents and purposes were crooks, who uh, sold our ground, sold our ground for profit without having planning permission for us to go anywhere. Right. So, you know, Liam Brady could have had the best players at his disposal on the pitch, but unfortunately because of what was going on off the field, and the fact the club was just in complete meltdown, um, he was never going to be able to get anywhere. I mean, he, he saved us from relegation and, and, and did well in spite of everything that was going on mm-hmm. off the, off the field. But he was never, ever going to be able to lead us to great heights just because of what was going on off it. And, and politics got in the way that way. And in the end, he, could, he, he couldn't go on any further and, um, and he left. But again, just uh, having heard that as well, Spencer, it's, it's a shame for Liam Brady because he walked from one basket case of a club to, to another one because Celtic were in disarray back then as well. <laughs> and, the patron uh, saint of basket cases, yeah, yeah. I think after that, probably sickened him in football management because he never had another appointment uh, as a manager after that in club football. But, I think um, he went back, didn't he, to where to his first his first love, which was Arsenal, and he worked kind of with the uh, the younger kids in the academy, kind of there. Yeah, I, th- I think if uh, if Celtic um, if he couldn't do it with Celtic and he couldn't do it with Brighton, he couldn't do it anywhere. So he yeah, he went back to where he was loved and appreciated. He went back to an easy life, maybe. But I would love to speak. To, I'd love to speak to Liam Brady actually, because that was an interesting time at Celtic back then. A difficult time for the manager to come in and, and make any kind of change. That's in Tony Cascarino's book, isn't it? As well, he wrote. I don't know if you've read that. He, oh, he wrote. Oh. You know, I mean, that is that's one of those those great sports books where you, you know you read it and you think there's bits in there where you think, oh man, I don't know if I'd have been on. I don't know if I'd have been that honest. It's brutally <laughs> honest, and I mean, <laughs> he's he is very brutally honest about his time going up to to Celtic, and of course, it was Liam who signed him, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think Liam felt that uh, Tony let him down and everything. Yeah, it soured well, their relationship, which was very good until that point. Yeah, I mean, the thing with Cascarino, you know, I must have seen the majority of the games he played for Celtic, and we were excited. I mean, obviously, we had signed um, some fantastic players who played for the Republic of Ireland. And, you know, we had Mick McCarthy, Chris Morris, and Pat Bonner, for example, in a team just leading up to this this era. And then in comes Cascarino, you just think, oh, he's going to score 20 goals a season. And he was a lumpy wood. He was a lump of wood up here. And he went on to play for Marseille. And I know he wasn't in the top division, but he was scoring goals for fun <laughs> for Marseille. But his book was interesting in that I didn't think it was going to be good. And then you read it and, you know, he's forging documents to get a game for Ireland and all this kind of thing. All this kind of stuff, you know. That was it, dyeing his hair as well to get contract extensions and stuff. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a marvellous book. That's one of those books which you read and you think, oh, I could have done with that being twice as long as it was because, you know, it's only about a couple of hundred pages and uh, it deserved to be longer than that. But it's a good read. Whether whether you remember it fondly or not, it's just good to read it just, just to find out a little bit more about the mad world that is football, isn't it, really? It is a it is a mad mad game. Uh, Mickey Quinn's is another one that I'd put in that same category. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's funny how you remember certain players who, or every time they used to turn up and play against your team, they always always used to score against you. And Mickey Quinn, 
he didn't just use score against Brighton, he would normally get a hat trick. All he had to do was just rock up, look at the ball, and he'd, he'd get three goals every flipping game. Yeah. Oldham, Portsmouth, Coventry, no matter who he was playing for, he would always score against us. I mean, I dare say Celtic have got players like that. And you can be. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Who, yeah. Would be, who would be your main nemesis who always scores against you then? Uh, against Rangers, it was Ali McCoist. McCoist, you always knew he was going to score and break your heart. And that uh, invariably happened for years. To be fair with Ali McCoist, I mean, he scored against most teams. I mean, the ones you always resent are the players who only seem to have it in for your team. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's they always seem to score against you as opposed to other teams. I mean, McCoist, yeah, he was, he was, he was prolific against everyone, wasn't he? Oh, he definitely was. And, I mean, the other, the other player, actually, who was a thorn in the side of Celtic when he played for Aberdeen, but then he came along himself and played a good few seasons uh, and ended up as a manager at Brighton was Mark McGee. Yeah. McGee, as a player, is well thought of at Celtic. He ended up leaving to go to Newcastle. Uh, Roy Aiken was down there at the time. But, I mean, he's had a, obviously he's had a huge, lengthy career in management, uh, mainly down south. How did he do at Brighton? Well, he, again, it was, it was a tough one for him. I mean, he started off very well. I mean, he was, um, for somebody who was a forward player and, you know, more of a kind of dynamic winger, he was the kind of manager who would always look to his defence first, tighten the defence up and then kind of work from there. And he tightened us up at the back and uh, uh, this is when we were in the old, well, League One, kind of the old League Division Three, you know, in England. And he got us promoted through the playoffs and that's at the time when um, the playoffs, when Wembley was being rebuilt. And the playoffs were being played in, in Cardiff, my adopted home city at that time. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the, the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff, but it is just a tremendous stadium. And we beat Bristol City in the playoff final that year. That was in 2004. And Mark was our manager then. He couldn't really kick on in the, in the championship, in the second tier of English football. And because of that, we kind of struggled. And... Um, you know, it was it was just hard for him then. You know, the best players that we had were were signing for other clubs. You know, the kind of, for instance, like Adam Virgo. Well, I know it didn't work out for him at Celtic, but you know, he was he was good under us. We yeah. lost other players as well, and I mean, there's only so so much a, a manager can do. You know, when his best players are going, and when you've got a limited budget and you're playing in an athletic stadium, you know, where everyone's getting soaked every evening, basically in the home games. Morale was low, so. Yeah, he was. He, he found that difficult, and eventually got got sacked. But um, I remember him well. He did well for us. He's another one like Danny McGrain. You wouldn't want to mess with him, even now. <laughs> no, he was a he was a unit, and um, he had a, yeah, he had that presence, didn't he? You know, Paul, that kind of you know when a man has that presence, and you think, hmm, okay, make a mental note not to offend you in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, it's precisely. Brighton, as you say, it's been a topsy turvy journey for yourself supporting the club since the nineteen seventies. Thankfully, it seems as though you are in a good place and a good position just now, Spencer. And then the coronavirus throws everything out the window and into disarray. Celtic are looking at um, the SPFL, hopefully awarding the title over the next seven days or so. Your club are sitting 15th, a couple of points above Bournemouth in the relegation zone. How do you see that panning out? How is that decision going to be made? And do you think it's going to be fair if they call it as is? Oh, that's a $16 million question, isn't it? Literally, really, in the case of, you know, Football South of the border, because there's, you know, at the end of the day, it just boils down to money. I think if, if, if there wasn't so much money involved in the game, you know, in England at the moment, then the season would have probably been null and voided or everyone would have said, okay, you know, let's just finish the season as it is and just kind of move on and look to the future. Mm-hmm. But of course, because of all of the sponsorship deals and everything that what's at stake, you know, they're, they're almost kind of, it's almost like they've got their hands tied and they've got to go forward. It's just ridiculous at the moment. I mean, you know, there's all talk about continuing with, a, with you know, finishing the season, but with no tackling. You know, and with shorter games and wearing face masks and stuff like that. And I know this is a bit extreme. I would far rather has, have no football for the rest of the year, you know, the calendar year or as long as it takes, rather than have this kind of compromised, you know, shallow version of the game that none of us really recognise and that's being played behind closed doors. And then come back when we're actually ready, then, you know, kind of restart like we are at the moment. 
I mean, you know, there's still five, six hundred people a day dying in this country. Football is, you know, football is, uh, is so much about your life and my life and millions of people in Britain. But, you know, let's get the other things in life sorted out first and, and then go from there, I think. It's, uh, it just leaves me feeling very uncomfortable that we you know we're, we're we're spending so much time kind of worrying about getting the season back on track. Let's give it time. Absolutely, Spencer. Now, having checked your your website and that for our listeners, is it spencervigness.co.uk? I've been looking at obviously your your work today in relation to journalism and your writing. Uh, you've obviously had six books now published. Uh, various subjects. I mean, I'm Celtic book after Celtic book at the moment. Uh, you obviously have a more eclectic taste than myself. And uh, <laughs> the third book, third book on that list, is very interesting in that you wrote a story on a player called Lee Roos, who was a former Celt. And that's where I obviously seen yourself tweeting uh, just a couple of weeks back. What I find interesting, Spencer, from the perspective of, of writing a book retrospectively, is, you know, to go through the archive, even just for a 1960s book, is difficult to get the facts, to speak to people. But you've chosen a figure who played in the late 1800s, early 1900s. How did you manage to tackle that subject? You mean, what the heck was I thinking, Paul, quite frankly? <laughs> um, I mean, that that one was, oh, I, didn't, I didn't choose it. It just kind of crept up on me. I mean, I was... Um, I, I had a phone call. This is going back 20, actually, it's 21 years. It was before Christmas 1999. I had a phone call from a contact of mine asking if I was interested in writing a, uh, um, would I be in, if I were interested in writing a, a story, just a magazine piece or whatever, about a, a Welsh international goalkeeper who had played in one of these famous Christmas Day games in World War One, you know, in 1914 when when the Allied soldiers came out of the trenches on one side and the German soldiers came out on the other side, they met each other in no man's land in the middle and, you know, showed each other pictures of their families at home and had cigarettes and put up makeshift Christmas trees and then started kicking footballs around. And there wasn't just one game of football, there were lots of games of football that happened at length in, you know, at the, the, the Western Front during that Christmas Day, 1914. And I thought, Oh, you know that sounds that sounds brilliant. And so I went away and I wrote this this you know um, a piece for the Western Mail newspaper, which is kind of like the it's like the Scotsman is north of the border with you, you know, the national paper for the Wales. Uh, and I wrote this yeah I wrote this article you know about this Lee Roos character and a goalkeeper and who he played for and everything like that blah blah blah. Except that the story ended up being wrong because although ninety percent of the story was right about who he played for and, you know, uh, and, and where he was from and his background and whatever. The bit I got wrong was that he hadn't actually played in any of these Christmas Day games. And the only reason I got to find out about that was that in the, in the kind of week, days, weeks, and months after my story appeared, people were getting in contact with me to give me bits and pieces of information about this Lee Roos character. You know, did I, did I know this about him? Did I know that about him? And, and everything. And, and over the course of, of a while, I, I, I kind of excused the pun. I almost kind of became the, the, the keeper of all things to do with this bloke. You know, all of this information that boards, you know, to me. And, um, uh, this was, you know, um, the very early days of the internet. So most people were still writing to me then, you know, as in snail mail, old fashioned mail, phoning me up, you know, that kind of thing. So all of this information was coming in. And I didn't really know what to do with it. Uh, I wanted to forget all about Lee Roos because, you know, in many ways, because I've got this story so horrendously wrong, you know, so I wanted to move on and work on other things. Then somebody out of the blue said, well, did I know that Lee Roos's nephew was still alive and well and living in, in Shrewsbury, you know, on the, the England-Wales border? And so I went to meet his nephew and uh, he was he was 96 at the time, but he, he was able to tell me all of these stories about the family and about Lee, you know, the stories he remembered about. I was also able to, around the same time, to meet other people who had also known Lee, you know, other people who are in their 90s, you know, in their autumn years and stuff. If you, if you could imagine kind of George Best crossed with David Beckham crossed with Peter Schmeichel, that's what Lee Roos was like. He was, um, he was the first real kind of superstar of the game going back to kind of the early days of the 20th century. 
he was a, he was a household name which football players didn't tend to be back then. So he was um, he was a, a real kind of you know part part footballer, part kind of soldier and scholar and maverick and playboy and it was it just seemed as though there was this fascinating kind of character that history had completely forgotten about so i thought well if anyone's going to write this biography i'm going to so off i went and um yeah the first version of the book came out in 2007 but then the updated version came out in 2016 uh right. because even though he's been dead over a hundred years now new information keeps on coming to life about him and uh the one thing i didn't know that much about was his time with celtic which of course was very very brief as you know paul he only played one game and i knew very very little about how he came to play in one game the reason he only played that one match was uh he was an amateur player although a lot of players were going professional at the time Lee remained amateur and that enabled him to play for whoever he wanted to. And even though he was Sunderland's regular goalkeeper at the time, Sunderland didn't have a match on a particular weekend when Celtic were playing Clyde in the Scottish Cup semi-finals. This is back in, uh, in 1910. So Celtic asked him if he fancied coming north of the border and having a game for them. And, uh, he didn't need to be asked twice. He was one of those goalkeepers who was a little bit of, you know, kind of have gloves, will travel kind of type. So off he went and um, he played in the semi-final and I've got to say he didn't have his best game, Paul, did he? But Celtic lost 3-0 and uh, he was responsible for two of the goals by all accounts. And after one of them, I think Clyde's players, had, you know, one of Clyde's players had scored a, um, uh, a quite a goal and Lee ran after him and instead of belting him or punching him or whatever, he ended up shaking his hand and then strolling back to his goal and carrying on. <laughs> And so, uh, it didn't exactly go well. So I, I think if you, if your classification of a flop at Celtic is Adam Virgo, heavens knows what Lee Roos would be. But, um, <laughs> but I wanted to find out more because I mean, at some stage I'll be doing another updated version of yeah. my book about Lee. I don't know when, not sure when, might be a while, you know, but I wanted to find out a little bit more. And so I, um, I, I, I went on Twitter. I'm not very prolific on Twitter, but I thought, well, oh, you know, Let's just see if I can try and kind of get some more information from you know, the Celtic community, you know, a little bit more about uh, about what they might know. Mm -hmm. I posted this tweet and it, it got a ridiculous response, didn't it, Paul? Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Something like, you know, most of my most of my tweets on Twitter get about, you know, I'm lucky if I get three retweets or whatever, and I think this got about 175 or something or whatever, and out of that came quite a lot of information. Um, you know, people who had match reports, which, you know, they sent me and uh, other bits and pieces of information. I mean, I never realized, for instance, that the reason that Celtic needed a goalkeeper was because their regular keeper, he had, um, he had pneumonia at the time. And so, um, so Lee came in and, and played, played in place. But I was just fascinated by that because, I mean, Lee, as I said, was, you know, very much a have gloves world travel keeper. I mean, his regular, you know, he's, he's, he's probably best known for his association with, uh, with Stoke and Everton and Sunderland and also mm -hmm. Wales. He was the, the Welsh number one for, uh, for many, many years in the years before the First World War. But, you know, there's other little clubs there, you know, Huddersfield as well. It's like I wanted to find out a bit more about that. But the Celtic Association was, was, I, I was really intrigued by because as you said, it's just one game. Um, and it didn't go particularly well either. But it's brilliant that he got to play there. But uh, yeah, yeah. As I said, it would have been if they'd have won. Who knows? Maybe Celtic would have wanted him to stay on. But uh, mere speculation. Man. One of these things that you mentioned there about putting out an appeal on Twitter. Um, I started writing about Celtic in 2010, and very quickly, what happened, Spencer, was there was a small group of Celtic historians some who were authors and some who weren't, who just enjoyed researching about the club's history and assisting other people in putting together projects. So it, it was no surprise to me that you got that reaction because once the right people see it and start sharing it amongst the historians and the old heads, then what you'll get is you'll get people offering you their assistance. It's quite incredible. I mean, the incredible, the incredible thing as well, Paul, was about, you know, about three or four days later, you know, later when it had kind of calmed down a bit, I, I just tweeted back just to say thank you very much, you know, to everyone because, you know, it's credit where credit's due. It was marvellous. I was genuinely humbled. 
And that in itself, that got about 200 retweets, just me saying <laughs> thank you. Uh, as, this, as the line in the song goes, if you know the history, and there's so many of them. Spencer, what surprised me, I thought I knew the history. And then you start meeting these people who make you feel like a bit of a novice because of their knowledge is incredible, you know. But um, fair play to you because it is an interesting subject. It's one of the one of the players that when when you start hearing the story, you do want to hear more. And uh, that book, Lost in France, is available from your website. And I'll I'll put the the web address in the bio of the the podcast as well for anyone. Yeah, who sure. I think that. I think you can get that. I would say you can get that from any bookshop, but of course, bookshops aren't really uh, operating at the moment, aren't they? I think I think you can get it on the web. It's still widely available anyway. So yeah, yeah. One of the other things, Paul, that I found fascinating was um, what I didn't realise until you know all of this information started coming back was that um, one of the other players who played that day. Um, for Celtic, you know, and um, in the day of the the Scottish Cup semi final, mm-hmm. um, I mean, without ruining the end of kind of like Lost in France, I mean, it's not a particularly happy ending. You know, World War One, you know, wasn't for many. But um, Peter Johnson, who played for Celtic in that very very game, he also died in the Battle of Arras about seven months after leaving, and I had no idea that that was the case until people started, you know, in, in response to, you know, that Twitter appeal that I did. So, uh, and I'd never made that connection before. Again, you're always learning, Paul, aren't you? We're always learning. Absolutely. I mean, you're you're speaking to me as I sit here in Dunfermline, just a few miles away from the Peter Johnson Memorial in Glen Craig in Fife. So, well, there you go. I know. There you go. Quite Small good. world, isn't it? It certainly is. It certainly is. And... Um, you know this, it's been an absolute pleasure, Spencer, speaking to you because I think what today proves as well is that this is a Celtic podcast, but when you speak to people who are football people, football fans, what you can do is you can start to find links almost in anything. Between the two clubs, there are links everywhere. And we've been talking about ex-Brighton uh, stroke Celtic players. And then obviously a subject uh, that you dedicated a huge amount of your life to and there was a Celtic link in that. So it is incredible. It's great, isn't it? You're, you're, yeah. you're right, you're right. I mean, you know, Bright, Brighton is closer to France than it is to Glasgow. But, yeah, as you say, you know, it's, it's you know, so many connections. It's uh, They're all there. And, uh, yeah, no end of stories and, uh, you know, positive ones, happy ones and sad ones, as Lee's story is. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful kind of cultural thing, football. And it's, it's great that it brings us all together, you know, particularly at times like this, you know, where there's no football actually on the field to play. The only thing left for me to say is thank you so much for your time today. I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, the chat and if you are up this neck of the woods then please give us a shout and uh, we can maybe take you to Celtic Park and show you the experience uh, oh, That would be absolutely brilliant and also the uh, the Johnston Memorial I mean I've, as you said I'm, we're always learning things so yeah I'd love to come and have a look at that as well I'll take you Anytime. Up Now you take care Spencer and, and stay in touch alright? Will do thanks very much Paul and um, thanks Celtic fans for listening to the ramblings of this Brighton supporter <laughs> Bro, it's been an absolute pleasure. Take care. Cheers.